Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome. This is our fourth module in our spring CME series for the Department of Urology here at Yale. I am Therese Gardier. I'm a nurse practitioner in the department specializing in pediatric urology and I'm also the CME director for the Department of Urology tonight. I am excited to introduce two of our faculty members who will be speaking on Stone disease. Dinesh Singh is an assistant professor of urology, director of laparoscopy and endourology, director of the endourology fellowship here at Yale. He earned his medical degree from Columbia University. Dr. Singh completed his residency in general surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital and his residency in urology at Harvard Medical School. He is an expert in minimally invasive approaches to kidney stone removal as well as other minimally invasive urologic surgeries. His research interests include minimally invasive surgery, urologic oncology, and kidney stone disease. His current research is fo focused on active surveillance protocol in kidney cancer, the reduction of radiation exposure for patients with kidney stones, and finding the predictors for patients who have kidney stones versus other diagnoses. Peruz Moda Medina is an assistant professor of urology, associate residency director for the Department of Urology and vice chair of clinical affairs for the Department of Urology here at Yale. He completed his medical degree at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, his residency in urology at Columbia University Medical Center and an endourology fellowship at North Shore Long Island Jewish Smith Institute for Urology. Dr. Mona Medina specializes in treating and preventing kidney stone disease. He decided to focus on kidney stones because they impact every demographic, including men, women, the young and the old, yet have proven treatments. And we're looking forward to hearing about that tonight. Thank you both for joining us. We are offering one CME for this event, which, and this event will be recorded for later viewing. Um, please use the chat for any questions you have. We are going to have Dr. Singh speak first and then Dr. Mona Medina with Q&A at the end. Um, Dr. Singh, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having this opportunity to be able to talk with you about something that I'm passionate about. And um, as Teresa said, there will be a, an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, but I also, when giving talks, like people to have the freedom to um, ask questions as the topic arises and as questions pop into people's minds. So if that happens, please uh, chime in or use the uh, chat feature to uh, ask your questions. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about radiation, uh, reducing radiation, the diagnosis of kidney stones. It's something that I've been passionate about for a number of years, and uh, it's something that uh, uh, we hope to be transforming uh, care of kidney stones for the benefit of a large population of patients. And let me tell you why. Uh, I have no disclosures, and this was a federally funded grant that did this research. Uh, Chris Moore is an emergency room, uh, emergency department uh, physician here at Yale, who was the PI on this grant, and I was a co-PI on this grant. So the background, uh, stone disease is a highly uh, relevant public health entity, as 10% of Americans will get a clinically detected kidney stone. So that's a pretty high number, one in 10. I'm sure almost everybody, if not everybody on this call has either patients or a family member or themselves, uh, one of those who've had kidney stones. Um, it's a rising rate in kidney stones and the chances of getting a stone once you've already presented with a clinical stone is very high, flip of a coin, 50%. And it seems like there are younger patients who are getting diagnosed with kidney stones, which makes the importance of radiation exposure for young people even that much more pertinent. There are 2 million people in this country who come to the emergency room with concerns of a kidney stone. A million are diagnosed with kidney stones. It's a large health cost expenditure of $10 billion. 
The diagnosis of CT scan is not new to this group. Everyone's well aware of doing CT scans and finding kidney stones. Uh, one of the uh, early seminal articles from that came from Yale, actually, this group that published uh, in AJR, the big radiology journal about the diagnosis of uh, uh, kidney stones with an unenhanced CT scan. Uh, and they concluded that unenhanced CT is a valuable technique for examining patients with acute flank pain in whom a clinical diagnosis is uncertain. That was in 1996. And this is a graph that demonstrates uh, on, on this y-axis, the total number of ED visits and uh, on the x-axis going through time. And in 1996, that was the article that I mentioned to you. And you can see the number of CAT scans has gone up, not linearly, but exponentially since that time. And it is, uh, well, it, looking at, at the time frame from 1996 to 2007, in this article published in Academic uh, uh, Emergency Medicine, you can see that there was a tenfold increase in the number of patients who were getting a CT scan in whom a kidney stone was suspected. And it's now the case that 70% of all patients who come to the emergency room with a suspected kidney stone are getting a CAT scan. So CAT scans are, are widely used, and uh, many of you probably have seen in the situations where CT scan almost supplants a physical exam. Someone comes in with suspected kidney stone or abdominal pain, eh, get a CT scan. Uh, and sometimes that uh, is done even before or instead of a physical exam. And the risks of radiation have become increasingly understood, and we're hearing more and more about it. There have been some prominent studies in prominent journals like the New England Journal of Medicine that have demonstrated that for those patients who are getting CT scans for, for kidney stones, that there'll be an additional 500 to 1,500 uh, cancers diagnosed. So uh, in other words, in about a million CAT scans that are done, there'll be a thousand new additional malignancies that can be attributed to the radiation exposure from their CT scan. And remember that statistic that 50% of people who have a kidney stone will get a kidney stone again, a clinical kidney stone, not just one that's noted on imaging, but come to presentation to a doctor or an APP because of pain. So these patients are particularly relevant when talking about radiation because they're often exposed to multiple radiation imaging studies over time. And as I explained to patients that radiation is not like a drug that gets metabolized and washes out of your system and it's gone, the effect of radiation stays with you and it's a cumulative effect over years. Much of the data on how harmful radiation is and how much radiation is harmful to cause secondary malignancies comes from the uh, Japanese data from the atomic bomb and survivors of the atomic bomb, as well as nuclear power plant workers. And it's been found that the average radiation dose absorbed for survivors who develop a cancer is about 40 millisieverts, which is roughly about two to three standard CT scans. But that's the average. It can be less than that, of course, like all averages and more than that. And I'm gonna show you some data about what this 40 millisieverts means in, rel in relation to an abdominal pelvic CAT scan. So a term that's often used when talking about radiation exposure in medicine is ALARA, and it stands for as low as reasonably achievable. And it's a self-explanatory term, and everyone agrees with it. There's nobody who says, ah, we, should, we should do more radiation or let's do as much radiation as we can. There's nobody who says that. Everyone will say, sure, as low as reasonably achievable, yes, that's what we should do. And sure, that sounds good, 
It sounds good on paper. We all agree with that. But, uh, and, and, and not only do we all agree with that, but uh, the American College of Radiology has said that low dose techniques are preferred for the detection of kidney stones with CAT scan. Jim Brink was our uh, former chairman of radiology here before he went to Mass General. And he was head of uh, the American College of Radiology and head of the uh, dosimetry group. And it was a, a group where uh, multiple institutions, 93 institutions, collected all of their CT scan data and how many were done, how they were done, how were they protocoled, what kind of radiation exposure was given. And we had access to that data. And it was very informative to us and something that shaped our study and our desire to do the study I'm going to present to you. And it's informative because despite Alara that we all agree with, every single person will say, yes, we should do as low as, as achievable radiation. Of course we should. Despite that, with these 93 institutions, most of them were high-end academic state-of-the-art places, only 2% of those institutions were doing true low-dose CT scans for the detection of kidney stones, 2%, which is a staggeringly low percentage, despite all of the talk of radiation, all of us agreeing that low-dose radiation is important. And some of the, let me show you this data here. This is uh, coming from that study that was published, that, that we published, that 2% of, um, of institutions were doing low dose. You can see that if we call low dose three millisieverts or less, which by the way, is about the exposure of a KUB, uh, only 2% of them were doing it that low. And the mean dose was somewhere uh, around uh, 11 to 13 millisieverts. So very high, and this is out of many thousands of CT scans across many institutions. So what? So why? What, what are the barriers to doing low dose CT scan? Why doesn't everybody just get it? Why is it just two percent? Well, we feel that uh, lack of awareness is part of it. We all know intrinsically that low dose uh, that that less radiation is better than more radiation. But not everyone is necessarily aware that there are alternatives to higher dose radiation CT scans. Some people think that, oh, if you do the low dose, you're gonna get a lot of noise and grainy films and I won't be able to read it and I'll miss something. And that's a common belief. There are medical legal concerns related to what I just said that, oh, what if I miss that, uh, that uh, dissecting aortic aneurysm? What if I miss that uh, diverticulitis that, uh, that might perforate? And, uh, and then I'm on the hook because I didn't do a regular dose CT scan. And of course, like all of us in medicine, we get ensconced in our practice patterns and our habits and how we trained and old habits die hard. Well, what does it look like? So I wanna add uh, imagery to this concept of low dose CT scan because yes that sounds good low dose CT scan but what does it really look like and and I, I always say uh, you know in our conferences when someone presents a video presentation of of how to do an operation you know they present these highly polished operations and it's like the best video and it makes it look like this is how all surgery should be done and and uh, it can be deceiving so. I'm going to present to you, and I'm going to represent to you that this is a typical look of an ultra low dose CT scan on the same patient with the same stone. I'm not presenting to you the best result. This is a typical average looking uh, uh, comparison of a regular dose CT scan in panel A and a low dose CT scan in panel B. And you can see as you look at the muscle, it's more grainy, it's not as sharp, uh, but you can see this is, sorry, this is a small stone. 
This is about a two millimeter stone, which is small, and it is equally detectable on both studies. So with that background, understanding the importance of low dose radiation, understanding that there are a lot of CT scans that are gonna be done on patients presenting to the emergency room, that is an increasing diagnosis that so few institutions are doing low dose CT scans. We undertook a study, uh, this was that federally funded study to prospectively look at patients who are coming to the emergency room and undergoing a CT scan for suspected kidney stones. These patients were uh, consented ahead of time, IRB approved, to undergo a uh, regular dose CT scan, standard of care, regular CT scan, as well as a low dose CT scan done concomitantly. Now, uh, the reduced dose was divided into high and low BMI protocols because the heavier the patient, the more subcutaneous fat in the abdomen and pelvis, the less penetration of radiation, which makes sense. And then the less penetration of radiation for a high BMI patient, the worse the images are gonna be. So it was protocoled so that patients with high BMI would get uh, more radiation than the low dose, I'm sorry, than the low BMI patients, but still a low dose CT scan. I'll, I won't, uh, um, um, bore you with all of these details, but suffice it to say that when you're doing a radiation, see, when you're doing a CAT scan, there's two primary ways that the radiation to the patient is controlled. One of them is by the uh, uh, voltage run through the CT scan that's measured in KVs. And the other is the radiation per unit time, and that's measured as milliampere seconds. So you can change either one of those two things and the overall radiation dose is going to change. We changed the uh, voltage of the radiation dose and it went from uh, about uh, uh, 80 to 100 uh, kilovolts. And so the bigger patients were getting 100 kilovolts. Now, another question that comes up is, oh, well, you need special equipment to do that and CT scans are expensive and we'd have to buy a new CAT scan. It's, that's not the case. It can be done on any modern day CT scan, any of them. It just is a matter of changing the adjustments, which the radiology tech does every time. They change the adjustments for all patients that come in um, as to where the radiation, where the exposure will be, what the current will be, that's commonly changed uh, things, a spiral, how fast is, those are all commonly changed things. So in this study, uh, the patients who got the CT scans uh, were read by radiologists who were blinded to the other CT scan. So in other words, a standard CT scan was read in the emergency room by a radiologist involved in the care of that patient. And then the Low dose CT scan independently was taken to a group of three urologists, uh, uh, radiologists, board certified radiologists, who had no idea what the standard dose CT scan showed. No idea, blinded to it. Um, and they were asked to uh, look at hydronephrosis, stranding, other incidental findings, not just kidney stones, but other findings that might be present in the CT scan. And they dictated. Uh, uh, their report, and it was, and of course, the standard presenting to the emergency room dictated CT scan was done as well. And we're primarily looking to see if the accuracy for a symptomatic ureter stone, so anywhere from the UPJ down to the UVJ, anywhere from the ureter where it meets the kidney to the ureter where it meets the bladder. There are 119 patients who were enrolled. They were uh, of ages 43 as a mean with a standard deviation plus or minus 14 years of age. 43% were female. The average BMI was 30. So the average BMI was not a thin patient. Um, and 63% had to get the higher BMI protocol, which was again, that 100 uh, kilovolt uh, voltage for that uh, CT scan. 58% of patients had a ureter stone. 
on a regular dose CT scan, and 29% of them were larger than five millimeters. The reason that uh, five millimeters is picked is because most patients who have a five millimeter stone are gonna pass their stone. Close to 90% of patients who have a five millimeter stone or less will pass their stone spontaneously without any treatment. What we found in our results is that the mean dose for a standard CT scan was about 12 millisieverts. So radiation is measured in many different ways, grays, rads, millisieverts, grays per centimeter. The standard way of looking at it in terms of actual effective dose seen by internal organs is usually measured by millisieverts. So, I'm sorry. So, uh, the standard OCT scan was about 12 millisieverts. Now, in those who got a reduced dose CT scan, it was 1.5 millisieverts. That is the same amount of radiation or even slightly less than a KUB. So that represented an 87% reduction in radiation exposure to a patient had they just gotten the low dose CT scan. Now, of course, a, just getting a lower dose CT scan is only half of the picture because if it's missing the stones or if it's missing other alternative important diagnoses, then it doesn't matter, right? I mean, we can reduce the CT scan by just having the patient not get a CT scan. It'll be a 100% reduction. Uh, so it's not just reducing the dose, but importantly, are we detecting the stones? And here's what this shows. The agreement between a standard dose CT scan and the ultra low dose CT scan that we did was 94%. The sensitivity of picking up a urethral stone was 93%. The specificity was 96%. Importantly, all stones greater than five millimeters were seen on the reduced dose CT scan. And again, the reason that that five millimeters is important is because those are the patients who are less likely to spontaneously pass their stone and need some intervention. Now, let me flip back to something we talked about earlier in one of the slides about some of the barriers, about concerns about maybe I'll miss a diagnosis, maybe it'll be grainy, maybe I'll expose myself to medical legal concerns. Well, the two alternative diagnoses that were seen to explain these patients' pain were both diverticulitis and both were detected on the low dose CT scan. We've done another study that's been published on all the patients in our study who got standard dose CT scans for, for presumed kidney stones who did not have a kidney stone and looked at what were the percentages of clinically important alternative diagnoses. And that percentage is very small. It's about 2%. So I think that the, the, the barrier, uh, and, and one of my hopes in this talk is to reduce those barriers by people understanding that uh, the, the low dose is a major reduction in, C, in radiation exposure. It is uh, not going to miss uh, many significant alternative diagnoses. It does not require new equipment. And it really just requires an awareness of, uh, of this possibility. And it does not typically get done um, uh, without thinking about it. So it is still, even at our institution where we did this study, the default setting for the majority of people, uh, I think, is to do a regular dose CT scan, again, because of old habits and all those reasons I said. But when it's thought of and you actually put in a requisition and ask for a low dose CT scan, they are done. 
And this is all part of a culture change. It's all part of uh, changing uh, long ensconced practice patterns, which uh, as we're all aware is hard to do. But uh, uh, our hope is that this is, uh, you know, we, in general club, we always talk about uh, at, at the end of a study, is this gonna change the way you practice medicine? Is this gonna change what you do? Well, our, our distinct hope is absolutely this should and hopefully will change what we do for the diagnosis of working up patients with presumed kidney stones. I'd like to thank Chris Moore, who, as I said, was the PI for this uh, uh, grant and study. Brock Daniels in the emergency room was part of the project, as well as Carrie Gross, and uh, Crystal Esposito and Seth Ludi, who uh, uh, did yeoman's work on uh, uh, putting all the data uh, together and consenting these patients. Thank you. Thank you, that was excellent. It's surprising how um, low, is a 2% actually use the low dose uh, CT when the statistics are that convincing. Um, Dr. Mona Medina, do you wanna pull up your slides and we can um, answer this question? Do we need to inform patients if we choose to do a low dose CT to evaluate them? So, uh, I don't know if the mesh wants to answer that. Uh, George, the answer is no. Um, it's often protocolized by the uh, ER staff or the radiologist. Um, I'll use the. Uh, All right, Therese, are you able to see my screen? I can see it. It's a little bit, um, it's the not grainy. full, yeah, it's not full slide. It's a, it's a little bit cut off. Let's it's truncated. What if you go to your slideshow? Will it, will it show the whole thing? Let's try this. How's that look? No change. No. We're not seeing your whole slide. We're seeing about half of it. One second. Um, okay, there it is. Yes. Yes. Is that better? Yep. Yes, perfect. IMAX. All right. So, hi, uh, my name is Drew's Motamagenia. I'm also an endurologist here. Um, I specialize almost exclusively in kidney stones. Um, and we play a big role in the uh, educational mission here at Yale um, in educating our residents and fellows on the uh, management of kidney stones, both the surgical and the medical management. And so, um, I'm going to talk today about our uh, efforts to work up and prevent uh, kidney stones in our kidney stone patients. Um, I too have no disclosures. So uh, I'm going to briefly touch base on epidemiology uh, and risk factors for kidney stones, um, some basic dietary counseling I provide my patients, um, and then walk you through how we do a metabolic workup inclusive of a 24-hour urine collection for patients with kidney stones, and then how we use all this information to um, mitigate risk recurrence. So as uh, Dr. Singh had stated in the previous uh, talk, kidney stones are very common in the US. Uh, it's 8.8%. Um, more commonly seen in men, uh, risk increases with age, white race, obesity, and diabetes. I often tell our residents think of Homer Simpson as far as the prototypical uh, kidney stone risk factors. Um, and as far as the recurrence of uh, kidney stones, there was a group out of the Mayo Clinic um, that developed the ROX nomogram. So again, the recurrence of kidney stones nomogram, who tried to assess the risk of first-time stone formers developing a subsequent symptomatic stone. The registry had 2,200 uh, kidney stone formers, and they followed them over a period of time and saw how frequently they were to develop for, uh, subsequent kidney stones. And as you can see with each passing interval of time, 
Um, there was uh, increased total number of kidney stones, however, greatest uh, increase in the first couple of years, and then it tapers off and flattens out. Um, as Dr. Singh said, the lifetime average is a 50% recurrence, um, but as you can see, most of that's in the first few years. And again, the big drivers of uh, recurrence are age, male sex, and white race. Um, there were other factors that they found significant, um, things that we consider. So a non-calcium stone is a big risk factor. Or if there were stones in regions of the kidney were, which were difficult to reach surgically from so the lower pole, or if they had other uh, concomitant uh, silent or asymptomatic stones or contralateral stones, indicating their overall risk factor for making kidney stones. So when we take this information into consideration, it's uh, you know, how likely are they to uh, make a, a kidney stone in the future helps determine how we, how we follow these patients. So as far as uh, who we keep in the clinic and we, were, we are going to uh, image in the future, it really depends on what their overall risk of making a subsequent kidney stone is. Um, now, my preferred uh, modality for frequent surveillance of uh, recurrence would be ultrasound. There is, you know, it doesn't get any more Alara than that. Uh, it's no radiation. Um, and it's probably good enough to find clinically significant stones. However, in some individuals, um, I will opt for a KUB or now a low dose CT scan um, if they have a history of a challenging anatomy to image. Uh, parenchymal stones that um, will show up positive on an ultrasound, but we'll be able to determine whether in the tissue or in the collecting system uh, on a CT scan, or if they have a very echogenic kidney uh, that is hard to image well. Um, and then how often we'll do this imaging is dependent on what the risk factor for recurrence is, so you know, for, uh, informed by that nomogram. And then the second aspect would be, um, would we do a metabolic evaluation on these patients or, um, or just follow them as is? And again, that depends on their recurrence risk and if we've uh, considered starting a medication to help mitigate the risk of stones uh, to dose the efficacy of that medication. So with regards to the metabolic workup, who should go undergo an initial workup? So as far as our society guidelines, they do recommend recurrent stone formers uh, to, to undergo a metabolic workup because there's some factor in them that's creating the stones. But as far as first time stone formers, younger patients um, with a concern that there may be a genetic component or predisposition for stones over their longer life expectancy. And then for those who a, a stone event is more high risk. So someone with a solitary kidney, um, pilots, and you know, out here in New Haven, we'll see submariners from the Groton base um, who we, they cannot have any kidney stone events, obviously. Certain medical risk factors, hyperparathyroidism, kidney disease, get out, diabetes, and then uh, renal tubular acidosis is a big one as well. Patients with uh, GI malabsorption, uh, Crohn's or IBS, I'm sorry, uh, Crohn's or uh, ulcerative colitis, and bariatric surgery are big risk factors as well. And then anyone who's interested in, in taking a deeper dive into what their uh, specific risk factors may be. Regardless, I always counsel them on uh, dietary uh, options to, to lower the risk um, prior to doing a 24-hour urine collection. And I'll ask, give them an opportunity to integrate uh, these, these uh, recommendations into their lifestyle as best they can or what they're willing to do up front. And then we do the test to see how much further they need to go um, or if what they've done is good enough. So this is a real basic overview of something I, I go into with the patients in, during their uh, consultation. Um, it's four points. Drink lots of water, which is another way of saying make lots of urine, a low sodium diet, um, adequate calcium intake, and that's probably the one that's most surprising to the patients, and a low animal protein diet. And we'll go into where these uh, recommendations come from. When we order a 24-hour urine collection, and this is an example of the uh, printout that we get from Litholink, uh, a lab that does this really well. And it's very easy to read. Um, it's color-coded. Factors that are in green are good. Those that are in the orange or red are bad and should be corrected. However, there's still a flow to interpreting this and, and rationalizing uh, recommendations based on that. And so I'm going to walk you through what, how I look at a 24-hour urine collection and how I teach our residents and fellows. Um, so the first thing I look at is how much volume they, they produce that day. And if it's low, we increase their fluids. Now this recommendation, although it seems intuitive, actually came from a study, uh, it's the Borghi group from Parma, Italy. And he randomized uh, a group of patients who had kidney stones 
to either a standard fluid intake or a high fluid intake. And they followed them for five years. And the standard group had about a one liter fluid intake a day, the high fluid group 2.6 liters a day. As you can see, they had half as many stones over the five year period in the high fluid group. And the time to their stone recurrence was longer as well. So this is what drives our recommendations for increased fluid intake. Now, what should they drink? Everyone always thinks water. It's, I'm always surprised that a lot of patients actually don't like the taste of water. I'll ask them to put lemon juice in it to improve the taste. Um, but anything that creates urine counts. So coffee, tea, beer, wine, those are all good. And our goal is um, for them to produce two and a half liters of urine a day. Um, the only thing I ask them to avoid would be uh, colas or brown sodas, uh, given the phosphoric acid in the soda increases the risk of kidney stones by about 6%. So after we correct their fluid, I look over at the calcium. And if the calcium in the urine is elevated, then the next thing I look at is the sodium. If sodium is high, you obviously have to reduce that. So where does this come from? Two studies uh, showed the benefit of uh, sodium reduction in calcium stone risk. So this first one, I looked at men with high urinary calcium and a history of calcium oxalate stones and randomized them to, again, a high fluid intake diet or a high fluid plus low sodium diet. And they followed them for three months and they checked their urine twice during this uh, time period. And the high fluid low sodium group showed reduced urine calcium and urine oxalates. 27% um, more men in the low sodium group were able to achieve a normal urine calcium level by reducing their dietary sodium. Um, a more refined study, again, by the Borghi group from Parma, Italy, randomized men with high urine calcium and uh, calcium oxalate stones to a low calcium diet, which at the time was still the prevailing uh, theory for stone reduction versus, or, but, but there were some data coming out that uh, low calcium diet may not be in fact beneficial versus normal calcium with low sodium and low protein. They followed these men for five years, and they found that the diet with normal calcium, low sodium, and low protein reduced the risk of kidney stone recurrence by half. Um, both groups lowered their urinary calcium, but it was the normal calcium, low sodium, low protein group that actually reduced their urine oxalates as well. And so based on these data, um, we conclude that a low sodium diet, amongst other things, uh, reduces the risk of kidney stones. So I recommend the DASH diet, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, as this is a pretty um, well-regimented uh, diet on, on how patients can reduce uh, sodium, where it comes from, how it's hidden in certain foods. Um, the goal, again, is less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day. And then it's the, cal the calcium target would be 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. Okay. And I'll come back later and discuss why calcium is so important. So if we can normalize the sodium, or if it was normal to begin with, and, this, and the calcium still remains elevated, that's when we'll do special testing like uh, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D levels. Um, Let's we'll check up uh, PTH uh, right off the bat if, um, A, the urine calcium was high was despite a normal urine sodium. If their serum calcium levels were elevated, if they had pure calcium phosphate stones or nephrocalcinosis, as that may be an indication of something else going on. If the uh, parathyroid hormone is indicative of primary hyperparathyroidism, I refer them to endocrinology for further workup and evaluation and treatment. However, if the urine calcium is normal, I'm sorry, elevated despite uh, a normal sodium and normal PTH level, that's when I'll consider starting a thiazide for presumed renal leak of calcium. Of course, with the thiazide, you have to check the, soda, uh, the potassium and replete as needed. And once again, a normal calcium diet. So moving on from calcium, I check the urine pH and the citrate. And if both or either is low, I'll advocate for more fruits and vegetables and consider adding an alkalinizing agent like uh, potassium citrate uh, to their medical regimen. Now, urine is normally acid, acidic relative to serum. Uh, and certain stones tend to form favorably in acidic urine, such as uric acid and cysteine stones. And so by alkalinizing the urine, you can prevent those stones. 
cysteine stones have to be alkalinized. Uh, the urine has to be really alkalinized and it can be very challenging to get to that level. Um, we have to be careful not to over alkalinize their urine because calcium phosphate stones prefer uh, an alkaline urine. However, citrate plays other roles as well. Citrate is primarily excreted from the proximal tubule um, and the excretion is decreased when there is systemic acidosis. So metabolic syndromes and other situations which increase systemic acidosis will decrease the excretion of citrate into the urine. Citrate's important because it's an inhibitor of calcium stones. It prevents the crystals to, uh, from coming together. Again, it's found in most fruits and vegetables and medical treatment to increase alkalinization and citrate as a result is primarily potassium citrate, which is given three times a day um, with meals. Alternatives include sodium citrate. Uh, potassium bicarb would be something that I often go to for patients who um, have an upset stomach with potassium citrate, which is a common side effect. That's a effervescent uh, tablet. Um, and then lastly, sodium bicarb. Sodium bicarb gets a little bit of a bad rap with kidney stones. Uh, there's a concern that the, again, the sodium will increase the uh, calcium excretion uh, and uh, worsen hypertension. Some recent data saying that maybe it's the sodium and chloride together that's uh, necessary for the, uh, both of those effects to happen and sodium bicarb is safe. Um, a cheap trick would be half a teaspoon of baking soda, which gives you about 20 milliequivalents of um, alkalinizing agent, All right? Surprisingly, or for some reason, a lot of insurance companies uh, aren't covering potassium citrate well, they consider it a supplement. So we have to go for these uh, cheaper tricks. So once the pH and citrate is normalized, I'll look over at the uric acid. And if that's high, I ask the patient to decrease their meats. So hyperuricosuria is a risk factor for calcium oxalate stones. There's no trial to support this. However, high purine diets increase uric acid excretion and lower the urine pH. Um, when we ask patients to do this, many times they're saying, oh, I don't eat beef or I don't eat pork. I eat primarily chicken and fish. Um, however, it's all meat. So chicken, fish, beef, pork, turkey, lamb, I tell them it's all the same. Chicken and fish may actually be worse than beef. Um, it's the purine content, not the cholesterol that we're curried, uh, concerned about. And so um, a, a low animal protein diet is, uh, is important. Allopurinol has been shown to reduce the risk of calcium oxalate stones for patients with hyperuricosuria. Again, that's to get the uric acid out of the urine. Um, it does not, it does not primarily used for um, patients with uric acid stones. We try to alkalinize them primarily. And then lastly, the oxalates. So this is something that's harped on a lot in the uh, lay press. And if you were to Google kidney stone diets, they, they really try, you know, patients come and saying, well, cut out all my oxalates. It's, it's relatively low on my priority list. And if the oxalates are high, I really push the dietary calcium at this point. And if there are any foods in their diet that's really high in oxalates, sure, we'll, we'll cut those back. So I'm gonna go back to the calcium and talk, to, talk about that. And, and this is where it's really important. So there have been studies looking at the effects of dietary calcium on uh, kidney stone risk in men. And this, this uh, registry study looking at diet in men found that when they broke the calcium intake um, but by quintiles, those in the lowest quintile were at the highest risk for kidney stones and those in the highest quintile uh, at a decreased risk for kidney stones. When they broke it down by age, uh, the effect was primarily in men less than 60 years of age, and there wasn't as much of an effect in men over the age of 60. So what we can include is that uh, increased dietary calcium reduces the risk of kidney stones in young men. What about women? So same effect, increased dietary calcium was found to reduce the risk of kidney stones in um, all women. However, the uh, risk of kidney stones increased when calcium was consumed in the form of a supplement, okay? When they broke this down by age, uh, the supplements, the detrimental effects of supplement uh, washed out for younger women, um, but the uh, dietary calcium uh, benefits persisted. So what we can conclude is that dietary calcium decreases the stone risk in young men and all women. However, supplemental calcium does not have the same benefit. Um, not exactly sure why supplemental calcium doesn't have the same benefit. It may be the timing of uh, when the uh, supplement is taken as opposed to dietary calcium that's mixed with food. So where can our patients get their uh, calcium from? Obviously dairy is a great source of calcium. However, many diets now are pulling uh, dairy out for inflammatory reasons or you know, uh, 
GI intolerance, but it doesn't have to be from dairy. It can be from produce. Um, oranges are a great source. Uh, collard greens, broccoli, all good sources of calcium. Fish with bones, good sources of calcium. So why is calcium important? The theory is that dietary oxalate is free to be absorbed from the gut, from food. However, if you have a calcium rich diet, the oxalates in the gut are bound to the calcium and you pass it in your stool. So it's leached out and it's not, does not have the opportunity to be absorbed. Granted, much of the oxalates that is excreted in the urine are endogenous and created by the liver, um, but this is a good start. So what foods are rich in oxalates? Rhubarb, spinach, beets, tofu, almonds, chocolate, and then overuse of vitamin C increases the uh, oxalate production. So if someone's saying I eat you know, three spinach salads a day, I'll ask them to cut back on that. And unfortunately, a lot of these foods are also healthy and we want our patients to have healthy food options. So let's say all the numbers look good and all the values are in that green range and, and, um, and the patient's still making stones. What do you do that? Well, at that point, it's not unreasonable to start them on a potassium citrate and thiazide. And these are to reduce calcium excretion and uh, increase the fermenters. So how do we reduce calcium excretion? By limiting sodium, by limiting animal proteins and um, through medical management. Um, hydrochlorothiazide is known to reduce the excretion of calcium in the urine. Um, however, unlike the blood pressure dosing, it needs to be dosed twice a day to be effective for kidney stones. Again, check the potassium and replete if needed. Chlorothaladone is a long acting version of hydrochlorothiazide and so it can be dosed once a day and it's more convenient. Dapamide is another option. And for patients who really suffer from the hypokalemia, um, ameliorite is another option. So here's the uh, flow that we went through. It seems complicated, but if you take it in, uh, step by step, um, it's, uh, it's, it makes sense and it's actually not that challenging. Really what it distills down to is drinking lots of water, um, low sodium diet, again, less than 200 to 300 milligrams a day or the DASH diet and adequate dietary calcium. A low animal protein or less than six ounces a day is, is preferred. Um, whether everyone should be ordering a, a 24 hour urine collection or not is, is probably not beneficial. There's a lot of controversy about the benefit of a 24 hour urine collection in um, reducing the risk of kidney stones. And um, we often do it, I think, for objective reasons to show the patient, hey, here are the factors that need to be corrected or for medication management. Um, so these four factors I feel are, are uh, can be widely adopted and um, aren't difficult to do and probably are good for their overall health too. So there isn't too many downstream negative effects. Um, so that's all I had prepared for today. Um, you can feel, to reach out, uh, feel free to reach out via email if, if you have any questions or I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I actually do have a question because I see a lot of teenagers who have kidney stones and we always typically order the litho link. Um, and some of these kids are 15, 16 years old. So would the recommendation be to not order it and to go ahead with just making those dietary recommendations? So I start off with the dietary recommendations independent of my plans of doing that 24 hour urine collection or not. Um, and it, you know, if there are, you know, if, you know, you have the patient say, well, I have maybe two glasses of water a day and I eat bags of potato chips and, you know, you got, you got room to work with them. Right. However, if you have, if you have the vegan who, you know, who doesn't eat meat and um, doesn't consume high salt diet and drinks, you know, they come in with a big Nalgene bottle, um, you may be looking for other factors at that point. Now, with your patient being a pediatric population, I think they're, you know, you're, you're more concerned about is there something else that's going on in there or if there's a strong family history? Um, we see a lot of people with uh, renal tubular acidosis or um, uh, incomplete version of that. Um, renal leak is a big factor too. So um, in the, the, the pediatric population, again, that's why the AUA recommends anyone less than 30 should be considered to have that. I think that's what they're concerned about. Um, but it's, you know, the real obvious patients who have room to correct, I think I would work on that stuff before going towards the 24 hour urine collection. Yeah, no, Cause it's just gonna sense. say like you voided 700 cc's over the day, you need to drink more. No, what do you think? That's usually that? exactly what happens. That's usually how it goes. Well, like kids don't drink, yeah. No, they don't. And they do have a lot of uh, 
salt and fast food, especially the teenagers. Once they get a driver's license, that's it. All bets are off, drive throughs yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, then do I you think, I'm sorry. I, I think for the young, the particularly young, because they're so far outside the mean average, the average age of stone formation, and because they have so many decades of life ahead of them, so their years of at risk are so much higher. And because so many of them, frankly, are very hard to make changes with. That's not to say you shouldn't do it. You should do all the dietary recommendations, all the instructions to have them make positive changes in their, in their diet and fluid intake. The fact is that it's, it's hard to change in young people. And so sometimes what can be revealed are medicines uh, like potassium citrate or uh, thiazides that can help uh, youngsters who are at risk for stones that are not making those changes. Same is true for adults as well. But for those reasons, particularly, I think the youngsters should have a 24-hour urine collection. Okay, very good. And then if you give the supplemental calcium with food, do you think that that will then help with the absorption and decrease the risk? That's, that's a good question. You know, I think, um, you know, it, it goes back to the, I think it was a USMLE question that stuck, sticks out in my mind of the uh, patient with Crohn's who had the poor fat malabsorption and results in the saponification of the calcium and they have hyperoxaluria as a, uh, as a result of that. And so the treatment would be to increase their, their you know, you give them Tums with their meals um, to do that. So again, I, I'm not exactly clear um, why the dietary, this uh, calcium had such a big difference in the supplemental calcium if those are the mechanisms other than potentially the timing of it so perhaps yes yeah. sense yeah it yeah. does make sense for sure it's interesting i, I think that um uh, uh, for those patients who have hyperoxaluria high oxalate in their urine levels it makes sense for them to be on calcium supplements with their meals to try and reduce the oxalate absorption and similarly, even if it's normal oxalate levels, since 20 million women in this country have osteoporosis, many of them, their PCPs recommend that they take calcium supplements. And because of the calcium you take, it's only a small percentage of it that's absorbed. For those patients, which is common, I tell them to take it with their meals. So for whatever, since they're going to take it, if it potentially gives some benefit in reducing stones, why not take it with their meals? Right. Absolutely. And a good formulation would be to consider doing um, calcium citrate as well. Okay, very good. Um, I don't see anything here in the chat. Um, I think we'll then wrap it up for tonight. Uh, these lectures are um, going to be the recorded. They'll be available as of tomorrow and the department will send out links for those who registered who are not able to join us today, but please share with any of your colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Singh and Dr. Munwadina for joining us tonight, both excellent lectures, and we'll see uh, next Tuesday for our last module in the series. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. All right, thank you, Therese. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you.